It was just such a nice neighborhood. And they had fun there. A lot of times, we would just be near the school and playing baseball. But we always ended up near what we called the Black Lagoon. To a child, it was like a wonderland. We had these rocks that we called pop rocks. We would just slide them across, and they would actually have a flame. And I remember my mother always yelled about our shoes. This one time, I came home, and she said, it looks like your sneakers are burnt. What are you doing? I'm just playing at the school. Mighty waters of Niagara Falls serve the needs of industry and the welfare of mankind. Niagara Falls in the 1970s is synonymous with chemicals. It was called Chemical Row because there were so many manufacturers along there. Chemical companies in Niagara Falls and across the United States were bearing a toxic waste. But that was their backyard. The residents' kids played in the canal. That's where they went. People had no idea that they were living on top of 22,000 tons of toxic chemicals. State Health Department declared a health emergency. A chemical waste is coming out of the ground. Birth defects and miscarriages. Severe migraine headache. Respiratory disease. Already eight cases of cancer on a 15 house street. It was hard to believe this could happen in the United States of America. Each and every one of you in this group is murder. It was doomed to be a screaming man right from the beginning. Can you tell me when I'm not going to lose any more children because one is already dead? Please tell me. It was like watching an accident in slow motion. There is no evidence to indicate an immediate health hazard to residents of the area. Residents at Love Canal really thought the government were going to rescue them. It really hit home for us that we have to make this happen. They're not going to do it for us. So that spurred me to want to do something. We've got to do something. I mean, the fight came to us. We didn't look for it. We protested literally every day. The women told us the state office had dismissed their studies as useless housewife data. They thought we were useless housewives. But we were stronger than that. Those women kept that story out there, and they would come up with all different ways to get the cameras there. I wasn't thinking about building a movement or anything like that. I was thinking about survival. This incredible group of women become the faces of environmental reform. Well, hello and welcome to the Great Lakes Now PBS virtual climate town hall about the history and legacy of the Love Canal tragedy and the current state of environmental policy in the Great Lakes region and beyond. I'm Anna Seisling, host of Great Lakes Now, and I'm truly honored to be your moderator for this town hall event tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. And that trailer that you just saw was, of course, from the forthcoming American Experience documentary called Poison Ground, the Tragedy tragedy at Love Canal. So throughout this town hall, we're going to be learning about the dramatic and inspiring story of ordinary women who were residents of Love Canal in Niagara Falls, New York. They fought against overwhelming odds for the health and safety of their families and of their community. In the late 1970s, these women, along with others, discovered that their homes, schools, and playgrounds were built on top of a former chemical waste dump. They activated to create a grassroots movement that galvanized the landmark Superfund bill. So we're going to be getting into all of that, and we're also going to talk with experts in environmental policy, health, and hear from residents of other communities who are fighting for their own environmental justice issues right now. But before we go any further, I want to check out a clip from my conversation with American Experience executive producer Cameo George about Poison Ground, the tragedy at Love Canal. For people who aren't familiar with Love Canal, this is really the first chemical disaster that unfolded in front of America's eyes. I wonder, Cameo, as you were uh, starting out this project, what was your personal level of familiarity with Love Canal? Well, I have to say, I am born and raised in New York. I grew up here, but in the city. And I think Love Canal was one of the, it's one of those names that you're familiar with. You know that it represents something awful. You know that it's related to chemicals, toxic waste, but I don't know that I knew all of the ins and the outs of the story that certainly I learned along the way of, of this production. So it's really, I think I knew the headlines of, Head Can of Love Canal, that it was, it was something awful, 
uh, something bad and it led to Superfund. And that's probably it. I don't think I knew anything else, to be honest. Wow. I bet you learned a lot along the way. Um, and, you know, speaking of things that I wonder if you learned along the way, um, just the role of women and the role that concerned housewives and mothers who were residents of the Love Canal area um, played in galvanizing this movement was so evident to me throughout watching this documentary. And I wonder at what point it became clear to you, OK, these women, these need to be the central figures in this story that we're telling. These women had to be the central figures of the story from day one. As soon as we started doing research, as soon as we started looking into how the world became familiar with Love Canal, how change was affected in Love Canal, it was clear that it, you could not tell the story without telling the story of the women, the housewives, the mothers, the self-described ordinary housewives who absolutely kept this story in front of front and center, in the media, in front of local officials, they are the ones who we have to thank for knowing what Love Canal is, knowing what your rights are. If you live, unfortunately, on or near a super fun site, this story, none of us would know what Love Canal was without these women. They are truly heroic in every sense of the word. 100%. And, you know, as we try uh, within Great Lakes now to think about and cover environmental justice issues and to think about that intersection between climate, health, social justice, mm -hmm. um, I really couldn't help but just look at these women in this documentary and think, wow, this is like really feels like the I am witnessing the birth of the environmental justice movement um, in a way that was really powerful. Absolutely. And I have to say, I really appreciated something that you said right at the beginning, that while this story is tragic and it's painful and emotional, it is also empowering and in a weird way, exciting because you see these regular people doing these extraordinary things. They do research, they canvass their neighborhood. Like I said, they go in front of government officials and they change the way that we think about how we as citizens interact with our built environment. But they also, as I said, they're really inspiring because they took, they took it in their own hands and they took it upon themselves to create change, to protect themselves, their families, their children, uh, their community. And it is truly a story of how a regular person can be a catalyst for incredible change. Absolutely. And, you know, as as the story is unfolding in Poison Ground, uh, the tragedy at Love Canal, you know, there are plants not growing. There are animals dying. And the residents, um, many of whom are still alive today, recount that this just seemed normal because it's what was happening to other people in the community. Um, and, you know, to that end, although the Love Canal um, disaster and everything that has unfolded in the decades since then, um, it certainly has that particular area in a different spot than it was in back then. There are still, um, you know, so many different environmental disasters and legacy contaminants and pollution um, plaguing and negatively impacting communities all throughout the country. So I wonder if you can speak to that piece of it a little bit about, um, you know, Love Canal was back then, but there's a whole lot still happening right now, including, you know, contaminants that uh, back in the Love Canal 70s days, folks didn't even know existed and are a real concern right now. So I wonder if you can sort of speak to, you know, a little bit of where we're at present day now. Yeah, it's it's the amazing but also really sad thing about this film that it is a historical documentary about events that happened you know, 40 plus years ago, but it is as relevant as ever. Just as we are unveiling this film and starting to do preview screenings, we were in Buffalo in the Niagara Falls Love Canal area just this week. We're learning that studies have come studies have come to light that forever chemicals are in our water supply across the U.S. We are seeing that in East Palestine, Ohio, there's just recently a settlement for 
uh, the people of that community whose water and grounds and air were contaminated after a horrific trail derail train derailment. So these issues, they are not in the past. And one of the things that really surprised me, quite frankly, was that there are people, young families with children who live in Love Canal right now, right in the area that we that we explored in this film. And, and I have to say like that shocked me. I thought that this would be an area that would be off limits forever, that people would be so familiar with what happens there that, um, that no one would wanna live there, but there are homes and backyards and playgrounds right there. And so another thing that, that we came to understand through the making of this film is that millions of Americans live within a mile of a Superfund site right now. And so it's not, we think about these areas and these names that we know, Love Canal, East Palestine. We think of Flint, Flint, Michigan with, with their contaminated water. But even if your community is not in the headlines, like you could be way closer to a Superfund site than, than you think. And I'm not saying that to scare people, to frighten people, uh, although it is a little bit frightening, but just to say that we have to be empowered with information. And I think that one of the things that really came from the making of this film for us was that we, we truly got an education into how to do research, how to find out what the air quality is like in your community. Again, how close you are to a site. There are just a lot of things that we sort of take for granted and don't take the time to research. All right. And you can visit greatlakesnow.org in the coming days to check out my full conversation with Cameo George there, who is the executive producer of American Experience. And uh, we're going to drop into the chat uh, a PBS link where you can find out where Poison Ground is going to be airing uh, for you on your local PBS station. All right. And before we start unpacking some of the topics that came up in that conversation and in the trailer that we saw just a moment ago, I want to remind you that it is really, really important to me that we always make room for your voice in these virtual events. So please let me know your name, where you're watching from. If you live near a super fund area, uh, if you live near a super fund site, what do you know about Love Canal? What questions do you have about the safety of your community as it relates to environmental toxins and safety? Um, you can drop those comments and questions into the chat as we go. We already have uh, quite a few of you letting me know where you are watching from. We've got Kathy Walters in New York. We have Sally in Norristown, Pennsylvania. We've got Kara in West Michigan. We have Mary in Indianapolis, Holly in Milton, Wisconsin, Barbara in Buffalo, New York. We've got Laura in Southwest suburban Chicago. Eileen is in Niagara Falls, New York, just two miles from Love Canal. Eileen, I'd love to hear uh, a little bit about what your neighborhood looks like in this moment and how you're feeling about the state of uh, just environmental safety in your community. Uh, we have Jim in Appleton, Wisconsin. We have Charlene in uh, Cheektowaga, New York. We have Kathy in Omaha, Nebraska. And we have Barbara who says, unbelievable that families are still living on that site. Barbara, I would agree with that sentiment. All right, so now I wanna bring some folks into the conversation. Uh, first up, we have Kim Diana Connolly, who is a professor of law and vice dean for innovation, uh, inter interdisciplinarity and community impact at the University of Buffalo School of Law. Professor Connolly, thank you so much for joining. It's a delight. We also have Mike Basile, who is a public affairs officer in uh, US, uh, US EPA Region 2. Mike, thank you so much for joining. And uh, we also have Dr. Opara. Uh, Dr. Ijeoma Nojim Opara is an assistant professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit. Dr. Opara is a physician and advocate for health equity. Dr. Opara, thank you so much for making yourself available. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. We're excited to have you. So Professor Connolly, uh, I'd love to start with you. You think about environmental law. Um, you know, this is obviously a lot of what you think about and a lot of what you work on. Um, and I wonder what the role of environmental disasters are um, in your work in environmental law. I wonder if you can just kind of kick things off for us by responding to some of what we've seen and heard so far in both that trailer and in the conversation there with Cameo George. Thank you so much. And it's it's very good to be here. This is an important conversation 
the story of Love Canal, and I can't wait to watch the entire video. The story of Love Canal is compelling. It's a really important teaching tool when we're teaching um, the environmental laws, including um, the law that I'm about to talk about. Because, you know, just 50 years ago, the concept of like comprehensively addressing toxic waste was not something that we really thought about. It was a new idea. And, and because of Love Canal and a couple other things that were happening in the country, Congress passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. Mm -hmm. We call that CERCLA for short. Um, they've been considering bills like it for a couple of years, and then they passed it quickly at the end of the, the Carter administration. And we usually refer to it as Superfund because one of the things that CERCLA created was this big fund um, and 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 that and that's why we refer, refer to it as the Superfund Bill um, or the Superfund Act. And so President Carter signed this bill into law with high hopes from Congress and from everybody who did this, and it was really the beginning of of reaction by the federal government to citizen demand and recognizing citizen science, and it created this polluter pays system with a governmental backup. Um, if there wasn't a polluter that well, could be found to pay. And at first it seemed very promising and it does provide some help, mm. but it turns out that it was a flawed system. And so that's kind of one of the things that, that, we, that we need to kind of know about. Leaders had no idea how expensive and how much time it was going to take to fix this kind of stuff. Because, you know, before we thought that when we already talked to stuff, they were gone. We know that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're still considering to face, we're still facing many, many, toxic sites that are contaminated that are on a list, but we can't get to them and we're finding more. Um, but Superfund, CERCLA, turned law on its head. It was, it really was turned legal precedence on their head. Policymakers were like really doing the thing which was bending the arc of law toward what they saw as a more just way of dealing with this. Hmm. And so it was revolutionary and important and also not enough. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you so much for that perspective, Professor Connolly. Uh, Mike Basile, I want to bring you into the conversation now. So you have been working in the government for 50 years. 35 of those years have been with the EPA. Love Canal for you, I know it's not just part of your professional history, it's also uh, deeply personal for you. And I wonder if you can share just a little bit about your background, both with the EPA and also uh, within the Love Canal area. Sure. I, I've been with uh, EPA, as you indicated, for 35 years, and it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. But Love Canal is just not a site that I work on as a community involvement coordinator or a public affairs officer with EPA. It's, it's personal. My wife, mother-in-law, and her six siblings lived many years and were relocated on 101st Street. So I, I got firsthand information from my mother-in-law who passed uh, just uh, a few years ago at the age of 94, what it was like to live through the disaster, uh, having to be relocated. And uh, uh, to, to be quite honest with you, my brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws that live there with my mother-in-law and my wife are well. Uh, and uh, when I was, when I, I, I actually did not work for the Environmental Protection Agency when the disaster hit, when President Carter signed the first emergency declaration in 1978 and the second one in 1980, I was a public affairs officer at the nearby Air Force Base in Niagara Falls. We ended up getting involved uh, with, with Love Canal because there weren't enough uh, uh, hotels and motels and apartment buildings to temporarily relocate 900 families, over 7,000 people. And as the public affairs officer at the Air Force Base in Niagara Falls, we ended up taking 75 families uh, who came to the base to live until they were permanently re relocated. Wow. Wow. Uh, Mike, I really appreciate your perspective and just the fact that you were there and like you said, not necessarily working within the EPA at that point, but still very much um, seeing and kind of standing at the front lines of how all of this played out for those families. Um, I want to just quickly uh, mention a couple of comments we have coming in from folks. We have Eileen who says, people have been told it's now safe. I've never trusted it. My mom grew up in Love Canal. Uh, Paulette is joining us from Canton, Michigan. Suzanne in West Valley, New York uh, says, uh, West Valley, 
New York contaminants, uh, Cataraugus, uh, apologies for the pronunciation there, Creek flowing into Lake Erie. Um, and Eileen says, I live a few blocks from factories where we often uh, hear emergency evacuation drills broadcasted. My son plays baseball in Love Canal. Many people I know, including myself, have autoimmune conditions and allergies. There's no question in my mind that these things are related to the environment. I've had a doctor tell me I am probably right. Um, I, I want to talk with Mike a little bit about his perspective in terms of just the erosion of public trust that's really played out there and in so many other communities. But before we do that, um, I'm excited to now bring in Dr. Opara uh, into the conversation. So Dr. Opara, as I said at the beginning of this town hall, you are a physician and you devote so much of your time thinking about the health implications of environmental exposure. And I wonder if you can just talk a little bit more about how uh, individual health is really tied to community health and by extension, planetary health. Talk about that a little bit for us. Yeah, thank you, Anna Marie. And thank you for having me on this program. This is a very, as my colleagues have stated, very important, very personal and just critical essential conversation. And we cannot discuss it uh, enough. Um, and so as you stated, listen, the the health of individuals is critically dependent on the health of the communities that we live in. If our neighborhoods are not healthy, if the water, air, soil um, isn't is, is toxic, um, it, it's going to 100% affect our health. And not just the health of the individuals, but the, our families, um, our communities, et cetera. So we know that there is a dependent relationship between the health of communities and the health of, of individuals and the families that live within those communities. And that is also dependent on the health of the environment at large. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of interconnection needs to be so important in the conversations where we talk about not just health um, delivery and health delivery systems, but also the policies of health and healthcare and public health. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm sad to report that we still have a long way to go in terms of making that connection and tying in those pieces. And one area immediately that I can think about is in training. I would like you to know, I really didn't learn anything in medical school about environmental health and the ways that it shows up in, in healthcare. So you would have whole neighborhoods, um, whole zip codes experiencing a health challenge. So as you know, we have uh, zip codes for 8217 in, in, this, in the Detroit area that has high rates of respiratory illnesses, asthma, um, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, etc. cetera. Um, and, and the ways that we're often trained is to think about, well, what are the lifestyle choices of those families or individuals or communities? Or, you know, uh, what is the, uh, what are they not doing or doing? We, we kind of bring it down to behavior, right? Or is it a genetic component, perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. We're not looking at the air quality. We're not trained to necessarily ask questions around, wait a minute, what water? What is the water safety levels? What is the air quality level? What are the soil levels? What's happening with the animals, mm -hmm. all right, in that environment? That could also give a sign about the, what might be going on environmentally that is impacting upon the neighborhoods, communities, and thus the individual. So we have an interdependent relationship with the environment, neighborhood, and communities in which we live. And so it's important to maintain that holistic ecosystem type of lens when we're talking about health. I really, really appreciate that perspective, Dr. Opara. Thank you for that. Um, I want to just mention a couple more comments as they're coming in. So we have uh, Andrew, who's watching from the Keweenaw Peninsula in Michigan, who says near the Torch Lake Superfund site, a product of the copper mining boom of the 1890s through 19, late 1960s and resulting toxic stamp sands. Maintenance and remediation is ongoing there. Uh, we also have a recommendation from Barbara, who says those interested can read the book Images of America, Love Canal, that was written by Penelope Plowman. I see Professor Connolly giving a, a nod of approval there. Um, I, uh, this author is a sociologist and attorney who researched the Love Canal uh, extensively. Um, so now, uh, Professor Connolly, I want to get back to you. So can you talk a little bit? You you touched already on the Superfund uh, creation, but I wonder if you can speak at all to if and how Love Canal created a any kind of formalized uh, framework for legal accountability and justice for communities who have been negatively impacted by uh, by the Love Canal disaster? It did create a framework. It's imperfect. Environmental injustices remain, as we were just talking about earlier. 
Um, but but CERCLA was this revolutionary leap forward. And it came because activists c caused legislators and leaders to say, you know, real people are being impacted, including children, and we need to react. And so it created, I'm, I'm not going to give an entire, I could give an entire couple hour lecture on it, but I'm not going to do that. But I, it, so it created this space where, where sites were ranked and um, ranked by priority. And then people, and then once a site um, was addressed, things were removed that were super toxic and then remediated um, the land thereafter. It's an imperfect situation. And so I do want to say, I was talking with my, my clinic partner from Georgetown. We went to, we went to law school a long time ago last night, Tom Tyler, he, he works DPA. So I got some impact in, input from him and he, we were talking about, is this good or is this, is circle is good, but it's imperfect. But then we kind of went on, he was saying, you know, the voting rights act didn't solve the problem of discriminatory practices to prevent people from voting, but it made it easier to see and address and have some pathways to do that. So again, super fun, huge, unprecedented unprecedented leap forward. So Love Canal and similar areas created momentum to pass CERCLA. And we need to use that. And I think we need to build on that. We have not done a good job um, updating a lot of our federal environmental laws. So sometimes we need to turn to state and local laws. Um, I, I do want to do a shout out though. The current administration through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act has added some money back in um, to what was a depleted um, super fund and is going forward on that. And so I think we need to, to watch what's happening there um, and also help current and future generations think about creative ways to deploy resources. Um, anybody can go, you already recommend, you already were saying that people can find information. Anybody can go to EPA's site and, and DEC site in New York and other, other state sites and look at what's going on in your state. Dig deep, there's lots of public information there. And I wanna not just get the people who are watching, I want us to encourage our newer generations to be curious and to be coming into a space where they're going to be ready to solve these major problems, um, deploying the laws we have and the laws that they will help us pass in the future. Mm, I really appreciate that. Um, Mike, I, I want to bring you back into the mix now. So I know when you and I talked prior to this town hall, you told me that you are currently involved in overseeing, I think you said 38 Love Canal sites. So places where agencies and the public are being forced to reckon with, as you called it, the sins of the past. I wonder if you can talk a, a little bit more about that. And also if you have any, uh, any thoughts or any follow up that you want to give based on what Professor Connolly uh, just said, you know, feel free to, to share that as well. Yes, I definitely can. Uh, you know, I, I, I work for EPA Region 2. We cover New York, New Jersey, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. But I work out of a field office in Buffalo where I have uh, 38 Superfund sites, one of which is Love Canal. 38 Superfund sites in the western central New York area and the Finger Lakes. The majority of these sites were found. Uh, and we, like here in Niagara County alone, where Love Canal is located, we have six national priorities list sites. All those sites have been remediated and contained. We continue to monitor them. They're, they're not only monitored, but we do it in the public realm. Every five years, we return to the site to make sure the site is protective of human health and the environment, like at Love Canal. And Love Canal, we are going getting ready to go into our fifth five-year review. The site went on the national priorities list in 1983. And it was delisted in uh, 2006. Uh, we're, we're pleased with the fact that it came off the national priorities list site. There was a lot of remediation that went on. Our first goal was to get people out of harm's way. Those were the 239 families living their backyards were adjacent to the canal. There is a misconception that I want everyone and all the viewers and listeners to understand. No one. No one family is living on top of, of the camp at Love Canal. We ended up buying another 240 homes north of Colvin Boulevard that were boarded up for eight to 18 to 19 years. Those homes were put back on the market after a 1988 when a habitability decision was rendered by the 
state of New York, where those areas were found. Uh, there are, it's in, a, it's in an area today called Black Creek Village, and there are families living there. We brought those homes back on the market six or seven at a time, put new roofs, siding, windows, and a furnace in those homes. And there are, uh, it's a prosperous community today. Hmm. All right. I appreciate that, Mike. Um, so I, I want to mention, so we have Clara tuning in from Grand Rapids. Uh, we also have a question coming in from Holly, who says, any thoughts uh, Any thoughts on the cleanup of Onondaga Lake in Syracuse? Uh, Mike, I'll, I'll put that one to you. Well, I wish I could, I, I could comment on Onondaga Lake, which I'm all not that familiar with, but I know okay. our agency is involved. There is a process. Um, we, we, we test water, soil. We test in all the media and air. And I am sure that the agency, in concert with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the, uh, the, the county health department and the state health department, are active, actively involved in the issues, including Onondaga Lake. Okay, got it. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Opara, I, I kind of want to talk with you a little bit about the sort of uh, equity lens of environmental issues in health. So, you know, these kinds of things often happen along race and class lines. We saw that play out in Love Canal. We saw the way that that played out in Katrina. And, you know, what's interesting about Love Canal is that uh, Love Canal, by my view anyway, um, in, in the documentary uh, Poison Ground, it looked to be sort of a majority white neighborhood, uh, many homeowners there. Um, and then there was the nearby Griffin Manor, which is sort of explored in the documentary as well. That was an apartment complex with a predominantly uh, black residential uh, population population and a lot of renters. So it actually, it seemed like a piece of what was playing out was sort of, you know, this issue of renters versus homeowners and a kind of socioeconomic hierarchy uh, was kind of playing out within the disaster response. And I wonder just given your view and the ways that you're thinking about things so intersectionally, if you have thoughts or um, comments about, um, you know, how these kind of varying factors can impact ultimately health outcomes of the people who are uh, experiencing the, these negative Negative, um, these negative uh, environmental disasters. Absolutely. So because of the history of the United States and the ways in which race uh, is written into the DNA of, of our, our country um, and how it ties into the economic structure, so racial capitalism, um, it, it, we do see that there's a disproportionate um, uh, impact on upon communities that are already disadvantaged as a result of structural uh, racism, um, whereby being forced to live in areas that are then chronically disinvested in and then disproportionately exposed to environmental toxins, which then impact their health um, in a disproportionate way. And so what you saw played out uh, in Love Can Canal makes absolute sense, right? We saw that, you know, from a socioeconomic standpoint, um, if you're not able to own a home, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, opportunities, economic um, uh, and, and political <laughs> um, opportunities that afforded you when you are a homeowner, um, the, the ability to, ha to have a voice and a vote, so to speak, in terms of uh, how you you inform or you influence the 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 political realities that you are you're you're experiencing, and when you have been uh, for many generations deprived of buying a home in certain areas, owning a home, or from economic opportunities to build wealth, um, therefore rendering you chronically uh, renting and and, and also intergenerationally, uh, then yes, it does compromise your ability to uh, build the necessary assets to be able to engage in that political process, um, as well as to advocate for you, yourself, and your community for your uh, react, for your needs, whether they're, again, their economic needs, whether they're health needs, et cetera. And so uh, just to, again, remind us or introduce the lens of the environmental justice framework, um, that helps us in terms of this intersectionality that I think is really critical as we engage in this conversation. And so the 
environmental justice um, is a movement and a, and a framework that really came out of the latter part of the 20th century that saw that a growing environmentalism um, um, and an environmental sort of you know concern for the environment um, that though was was robust was anemic when it came to recognizing um, issues of social injustice and understanding that various communities are impacted differently because of the structural inequities and injustices that already exist. Um, and so that becomes important when we think about the inequitable distribution of environmental benefits and hazards, but also the ways it interplays with um, the health outcomes of those of exposures to those environmental benefits, you know, and hazards. So it's an important lens to interject into the conversation because this is people's lived experiences. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to remind folks who are tuned into this live virtual event, let us know in the chat your name, where you're watching from, if you live near a super fun site, and uh, what you know about Love Canal or what questions you have about Love Canal, or maybe you have questions about uh, the health and safety of your own community uh, as it relates to environmental toxins and safety. Uh, I, I have a question for everyone, but um, I have one that I'm not totally sure, Mike, that you're going to be well versed on speaking to uh, issues playing out in Alabama. But we do have a question coming in from Barbara who wants to know, Mike, if you have any thoughts on the stamp project in the Alabama swamp area, it appears wildlife will be negatively affected. And I'm wondering, Mike, maybe if you don't know exactly, uh, you know, the project happening in Alabama, if you do have any insight into how the EPA goes about uh, thinking about the, the impact of, you know, the impact of toxins uh, on wildlife in, in different areas. Can you speak to that at all? Well, I can't speak to specifically about Alabama, but I can tell you one thing that, you know, when our agency is called in, it normally is called in by either a town or, or, or county or municipality. And when we come in, our first objective is to protect public health. I mean, I know we're a cleanup agency, but our first objective is public health. We bring in the, the, the county health department, the state health department, and then we will do testing, cross-media testing. We will test water, we'll test air over time, and we will test the soil. And we take all this information and we put it together and uh, we, we come up, we, we, we determine what the, the facts and the, the, the numbers are that will drive us to make a decision on what our next term of action will be. But we, we take that data and we present it to the state health department and for the US and to the US Public Health Service in Atlanta, namely the Agency for Toxics Disease Registry. And they then come back to us and tell us based on what we found in a community or adjacent to a problem area, they tell us what basically we should do to protect human health and the environment. While this is ongoing, we make sure that the public health are, are safe at that time. Got it. Thank you. And I want to keep things moving, uh, but I just I can't move on just yet because I'm so grateful to have someone with both you know medical background, legal expertise, working uh, with the EPA. So I kind of just want to go round robin before we uh, move along here with the rest of the uh, agenda for the evening. And I want to ask you all, uh, you know, more environmental disasters and legacy contaminants have surfaced in the decades since Love Canal. How has this affected public trust from your view? And what do you think is being done to rebuild it? Professor Connolly, I'll start with you. Thank you. This is such an important question. For So even new disasters and how we deal with them show signs of progress. Because when Love Canal happened, people were like, wow, this could be my backyard and no one's helping them. Are they going to help my neighbors? And now when disasters happen, most people realize that lots of them are exceptions to what our country's laws can do and should do with the EPA and with others to protect people from toxins and other disasters. And, and I guess the other thing I wanna say is preparation is key. Preparation and being aware is key. And so this Friday here at UB, an interdisciplinary group of people are coming because we are working 
on a book, an action and advocacy um, focused book called Resilience Before the Disaster Arrives. Preparation and having communities ready and having communities feel support from experts is really important. Giving the public a voice as we deal with we deal with now we're dealing with things that we don't have laws about an increasingly fragile environment climate change other urgent issues we have to prepare and we have to support the public having a voice and connections to those of us um, who are thinking about it and those of us like mike who are doing it mm, thank you for that dr opara i wonder what thoughts you have around uh public health from your view as a physician in terms of your question and public trust, if that's if that's correct, well, what's interesting as I was listening, um, you know, so the clip that was played earlier, uh, I I love the part where the one of the women that was that was being interviewed said, "We were hoping the government would take care of us. We didn't do anything initially because we thought that the government would take care of us, and then they didn't. So we knew we had to take care of ourselves." And as a black woman living in the United States, I'm like, okay, so that's the that's the chronic state of affairs for a lot of us. <laughs> Right? A lot of our communities um, are, have experienced, you know, being abandoned uh, and, and chronically abandoned until there is a mega disaster that affects, like, you know, what affects uh, dominant or, or white communities. And uh, therefore, then we get kind of pulled into the conversation um, and then left alone um, after everything has calmed down. We kind of saw, saw some of that happen, you know, with COVID and, and post the height of COVID. We're still in COVID, y'all. And so I say all that to say that, um, well, I don't know. No, you know, I don't. I, I don't know. I think that for on you know on behalf of minoritized communities and marginalized communities, uh, there's a chronic state of um, appropriate uh, mistrust. Uh, and again, I actually flip the framing to trustworthiness, where you know a lot of times our institutions and our governments and you know haven't necessarily shown themselves trustworthy, right? Like worthy of the of, of my. Uh, minoritized communities trust because there has again been that history that's still ongoing and that living legacy of not really being invested in and um and, and taken care of so there is some ways to go around ensuring that uh, and that has shown up in terms of in environmental injustice so you know take flint as an example but also many parts of detroit with lead we're still dealing with that um, you know, even today. So I think that uh, there's still a long way to go and there are a lot of conversations to be had. People are still learning new things about their own communities and, and their environmental exposures to toxins that um, there's, there's uh, it, it, it's not where it needs to be. So I think that this, I don't know that it's getting better for certain communities. And so there, there has to be a more nuanced conversation to be had along those lines, I think. I really appreciate that perspective, Dr. Opara. Thank you. And Mike, uh, finally, I'm curious, uh, in your experience, some of what we were talking about before, you are overseeing these 38 different sites. Um, I imagine that you're probably interfacing with a lot of different residents and members of the public. So I wonder if you can speak to uh, sort of what some of these environmental disasters, Love Canal being one of them, has done to um, impact the public trust and how you're experiencing that day to day in your role. Seven. There wasn't. There wasn't. A, we didn't have an educated public, but today the public is educated. As a result of not only Love Canal, but I think today people have more access to information, and they 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 are becoming environmental experts. We have determined. I am involved with community relations and have to reach out to different communities at around these thirty-eight Superfund sites including here in Niagara Falls. And just, just last evening, we, EPA in the state of New York, hosted an environmental justice listening session where the deputy commissioner for the state of New York and our administrator, Lisa Garcia, came to Niagara Falls and about 25 people presented their issues to each of them. Uh, and uh, it, was a, it was a great opportunity. I have to say the public... Um, maybe didn't didn't trust us back in the late 80s and 90s, but I think at the turn of the century, I think people are. We actually take the time to invest our our activities uh, focused on communications, cooperation, and coordination. We want them to be on the ground floor, and it's my responsibility as a community involvement coordinator to let 
them know why we're in their neighborhood and how we're going to assist them. Got it. All right. Professor Kim Diana Connolly and Mike Basile, thank you so much for your time. Please sit tight. We're going to bring you back on in a bit. Uh, so now we're going to shift gears and talk with some folks at the front lines of some other pressing environmental issues that are playing out today. So we're going to bring Dr. Opara back on and we're going to welcome two more folks into the conversation now. So first up, we have Teresa Landrum, who is a resident of Southwest Detroit. That's 48217, Michigan's uh, notorious and most polluted zip code. Teresa, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having well, me and allowing me to speak and lift my voice. We're really, really grateful to have you, Teresa. We also have uh, Mike Schreiberg, who is a professor of practice and engagement and director of engagement at the Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research and Michigan Sea Grant. Mike is part of the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. Mike, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So, Mike, I, I want to start with you and I want to ask you about PFAS and some other pressing environmental issues. But before we get into that, um, I know that you have been kind of, you know, sitting in the wings, taking in a lot of information for the last 40 minutes or so. Um, so I want to leave a little bit of room for you right off the top to respond to some of what you have heard so far. Yeah, well, there's a lot going through my head because it's been a great, great conversation here. Um you know, the first is kind of the obvious thing. It, it's amazing to think about like what has sparked this movement here um, and being so inspired by the progress, going back to Love Canal and Love Canal is one of the most famous of those stories, but there's been hundreds, thousands of those stories over time. And I'm inspired by the progress that we've made. Um, but I have to admit, as someone who's been working, I work mainly on sort of Great Lakes water issues. I'm also um, uh, a little overwhelmed by the places that we still have to go. I mean, if you think about it, and, and we're seeing more and more crises unfold over over time. And I guess the other thing I wanted to reflect on, I thought the comments were all wonderful, and particularly the comments from uh, Dr. Opara about the environmental justice movement, because one thing I feel strongly about, and I think you've got some great folks to talk about this, is that we are not going to get far in this movement unless the social justice and the environmental uh, movement are tightly linked. And what we had going on for decades was kind of separate planes of action going, going on that weren't linked, even though the problems, as Dr. Opara really nicely laid out, were completely linked. The movements weren't. And we're mm -hmm. starting to see that linkage now. And that's something that gives me uh, hope for the future, because the, there are two uh, roots of the same crisis. Right. And, and it has to we have to have united action together in order to move forward. So anyway, there's a lot going through my mind and watching those wonderful clips, clips and things, but those are a couple of things that stood out. I really appreciate those comments. Uh, we have Kathy, uh, who's watching from six miles south of Gary, Indiana. Uh, Monica Lewis Patrick, the water warrior with We the People of Detroit, uh, says, yes, we are the leadership that we seek. We must deputize ourselves. Uh, Beth says, watching from Tonawanda, New York area, Tonawanda Coke uh, slash Lind site is close by. Um, Teresa, I want to bring you into the conversation. Now, you are a longtime resident of Southwest Detroit, 48217, as I said. Michigan's most polluted zip code. Um, I want to hear a little bit about what your experiences have been there in 48217 on the ground. But first, um, similarly to what I asked Mike, I'm just curious, uh, you know, based on the work that you're doing around environmental justice in Southwest Detroit and everything that you've heard so far about Love Canal, I'm wondering what's running through your mind in this moment. Well, Anna, what's running through my mind is this mo at this moment is that Love Canal is my story currently. I live in a community that's surrounded by more than 42 major and minor polluting sources. And as you know, Detroit is the motor city, the, the capital that, I mean, the area that put the uh, world on wheels. And what we have when the, the downturn of the automotive in industry happened, Factories closed. People walked away from these businesses and just left legacy pollution. It is now being discovered that these areas have not been mitigated. We talked about super, uh, you talked about super funds earlier. Well, in the community that I live in, which is predominantly African American, in the black communities, super fund sites are going undeclared. Right now, we have a construction project, the Gordy Howe International Bridge. And what has been discovered? They have over 170 acres. That's a large parcel of land that has not been mitigated for lead, PFAS, iron, arsenic. 
and it's being dug up to build a bridge without mitigation. So in my community, we have pollution floating all over. And I, I love to hear the story of the women. Back when I started the environmental justice movement with uh, Dr. Dolores Leonard and Rhonda Anderson of Sierra Club, the movement was made and the work was done off the backs of African-American women, lifting up the health impacts of, of losing their children, a lot of cancer, uh, women dying at an early age from heart disease and upper respiratory diseases. And they talked about families and uh, uh, was it genetic? In my family alone, five of my members, uh, family members had cancer. Uh, uh, my brother, younger brother and myself, we're cancer survivors. My mother and my father both died of cancer. On my block alone, more than 12 people, a city block have died of cancer. So what's running through my mind is what happened over 40 years ago is still happening now. And as the uh, professor from University of Michigan mentioned, across America, my community mirrors uh, hundreds of communities across America that are happening now. When the Flint story was told about the exposure of lead in the water, well, we have lead in the air, land, and the water. So mm -hmm. we were Flint before Flint. And mm -hmm. then we have Benton Harbor, areas that are across the state of Michigan that are contaminated and people are still living there. They're not being moved out. Why? In my opinion, predominantly because they're African-American, low-income people. And uh, Professor Opara talked about the systemic racism that's interwoven into the fabric of America. We were redlined to these communities. So we are casualties of people's greed, corporation greed. So who's going to lift that story up? Us. Because as they said the government is not riding in on their horse to help us. So we triage our own community. We began to teach people how to lift their voice. And we began to talk to our doctors and learn that our doctors did, didn't know how to identify environmentally related diseases. So mm -hmm. that's another thing. How should we blend that with the medical uh, facilities to teach people, uh, the, not only the community, but the doctors and the local politicians about the impacts of legacy pollution. And mm -hmm. right now we're dealing with um, legacy pollution and no one's coming to our rescue. We've worked with Alan Waltz and uh, uh, Miss Shore of Region 5 EPA. We've mm -hmm. worked with them right now. We have a huge contamination problem that there is so serious. It's one of the city parks that we use they discovered is so heavily contaminated with candium and lead. They are now trying to uh, mitigate it. But guess what? They knew a year prior and they did nothing and let us come and play and, and fellowship on those soils. So who, where's the protection coming in? So what's running through my mind now is that what's happened over 40 years ago is still happening now. And mm. something needs to be done. Policy yeah. change from the top to the bottom. Teresa, so that's, that's I, what's running through my mind. Yeah, I, I'm so grateful to you for uh, for just making the time to join um, this town hall and sharing your experiences. Um, and I am reminded of, you know, a conversation that I had with Dr. Opara prior to this town hall, uh, where Dr. Opara, if I'm not mistaken, you said medicine is so political. And I wonder um, if you can respond to a little bit of what Teresa just said there and about, um, you know, the ways that maybe many of your colleagues or many other folks maybe in uh, in medicine aren't necessarily thinking about how all of these threads weave together um, and, and why we ought to be. Well, first of all, I just want to, Teresa, just bow and just sort of, you know, uh, give you flowers and the whole garden and the whole orchard. Thank you so much for all that you have done and do, um, and who just who you are. Thank you for being in this space. Um, thank you. I, I think Teresa said everything that needed to be said and said it in a more powerful way, even reflecting back on my previous comment around when we talk about uh, the public trust. Who is the public? So again, going back to uh, the professor's uh, comment, go blue, um, around the, and reinforcing the idea about the intertwining of the ju of the justice movement, uh, environmental justice movement, and to, to bring in the environmental work, but also the justice piece and have that be intertwined. When it's divided, then we have these thoughts from our representatives that feel as if 
um, the benefits and responses that have been uh, cultivated over the past years is equally meted out. But Teresa is here to tell us that that is not true. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about public, who is the public? Is the public inclusive? Or who is it representing? So that's one piece that I immediately um, responded to because that's, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Our community is not part of that public because it's it, it, we're not being, as she said, protected and named. As she said, we, are, we have super fun sites that are going undeclared. If you're not declared, you're not named, you're not seen. Can anything be done? No. So the harms continue unassuaged, untreated, unmitigated. And that's what we're seeing. In terms of medicine and our training and our practice, absolutely right. And I commented on this earlier. I learned absolutely nothing about environmental health, environment, environmental uh, related illness. The fact, again, the social, what we're calling now social, but we are evolving to structural determinants of health so that we understand that it's not a, just an issue of the exposures to um, unequal exposures to environmental toxins or housing insecurity, food insecurity, and all those pieces. But there are underlying structures, as Theresa said, policy that produces those inequalities or the unequal distribution of these resources. And mm -hmm. so all these things need to be taken holistically as we have um, these conversations talking about the structural racism that informs, you know, the ongoing legacy of redlining that informs ongoing segregation and disinvestment in our communities where we're not being invested in and, and our needs addressed, right? And how that speaks in an interdependent way, in an intersectional way to the other areas of society, for whether it's quality, healthy foods. How do you have quality, healthy foods when your soil is unhealthy? How do you have quality, healthy foods when animals are unhealthy because of the same exposures to environmental um, hazards, et cetera? And, and how do you have quality health when you are constantly sick, as Teresa gave her personal testimony in terms of the cancers? So we have to reform and, I, and the good news is that it is it's ongoing it's slow and i always say we need the voices of our communities to push and add pressure in terms of medical and healthcare not just physicians now with nurses pharmacists all members of the healthcare ecosystem clinical social workers and the list goes on pts rts all members of the healthcare ecosystem our training needs to be fundamentally um transformed so mm -hmm. that we can start to center these social and structural systemic drivers and determinants of health, those conditions in which we work, play, live, and make babies and worship and, and die and celebrate on. We need to begin to center that as medicine, mm -hmm. housing as health, food security as health, environmental justice as health. Otherwise, the little itty bitty thing we're doing, I mean, it's good, the biomedical pieces, but we know now from research that it only impacts 10% of healthcare outcomes, what we do in the biomedical space. 80% are those social and structural determinants of health. And so we, we still have a long way to go in terms of the training, the practice, our research and advocacy work to begin to center the issues of environmental injustice so that we can move the needle when it comes to health equity and health outcomes. Got it. Dr. Opara, thank you so much for that. Um, I feel like I am just surrounded by so many powerful and passionate speakers in this town hall, and I'm really, really grateful. Um, so as we kind of start to uh, close things out here in the next five or 10 minutes, um, Mike, I know that a lot of your work, so we've talked about a lot of different legacy contaminants at this point. We also, though, have this fairly new proliferation, uh, well, at least we think it's new, maybe you can hopefully shed more light on this, about PFAS. So, you know, the more we're looking for it, the more we're finding it. And you you told me before we had this town hall that Michigan actually has the most registered PFAS sites, but that's only because Michigan has been looking mm -hmm. for them. Yes. So I wonder, uh, Mike, if you can talk a little bit about PFAS and your work on this issue at the University of Michigan and how that relates to all of, uh, you know, what we're talking about here in terms of uh, water quality and safety. Sure. You know, and, and sadly, in some ways, it's the it's the same story over and over again here. Right. So PFAS and it's a it's a class of chemicals. There's thousands of them in there. And this is used in things like no stick pans, Teflon and in waterproofing, firefighting foams, et cetera. And it's this incredible chemical because because of the property that it actually lasts a long time. It's it's often referred to colloquially as a forever chemical and it's very stable. Now, those same those same qualities make it a massive health hazard because it sticks around and we've learned that it's got qualities that are toxic, they're hormone, hormone disrupt, disrupting, 
uh, cancer causing, et cetera, et cetera. And we're finding it everywhere. I mean, the more we look, the more we're finally finding it. We're, we're struggling with how to deal deal with this type of contamination. I mean, EPA just passed the first PFAS standards in drinking water, but that's like at the back end. So that means that we actually have a, a standard for how little can be in drinking water of a few of those chemicals. But I, I guess the point I want to lift, lift up here, and I want to strongly agree and, and support what we've heard from Teresa and Dr. Dr. Aparo and others, a lot of this comes down to systemic racism, and that's why things are cited in this way, PFAS and many others. And a lot of it comes down to um, our lack of a regulatory system that actually protects people up front. The way our system works, and I'll be very, very brief with this because I know we're short on time, but the way our system works right now is you have to prove over time, over decades, you have to prove something's harmful to get it taken off the market. What does that mean? Well, some of these chemicals can have impact. If you're exposed to them in utero, in the womb, it may have impacts 50, 80 years later. So we're talking, you have to expose people for 50 to 80 years mm -hmm. to do that. Now, if you look at systems that are better, like in Europe, they have what's called the precautionary principle. And that means you have to prove something is safe before you put it out in the market and before you contaminate um, other people. And, and that contamination, as we've heard, usually winds up with those who are least able to fight it, the un underserved populations and minority populations. So what PFAS is one example of a regulatory system that has utterly failed uh, now, and, and we need to reform that in order to move forward. Mike, I really appreciate the comments there. Uh, Monica saying citizen science must be a driving part of informed research. Um, also giving a shout out to Ms. Teresa, who is a community treasure and EJ expert. We are so grateful. We have Sue Kelly tuning in from uh, Ta Tonawanda, New York. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing that. Janelle is watching from Southwestern Pennsylvania. And we have Seagrin, who is watching from Missoula, Montana, but lived in Detroit for most of their life. Um, I I'm also wondering, uh, Dr. Opara, if you can speak to a little bit about the, the PFAS piece of this. So as I'm sure you know, you know, PFAS can affect, uh, can, can cause cancer, fertility, all kinds of health and well-being issues. Can you talk a little bit more about the known impacts of PFAS exposure and how this relates to the larger issue of water quality, access, affordability? Thank you. And uh, I, I'm happy to answer that question, but I have to, I have to respond in reflection to everything I'm yes. hearing. Um, and that is, we have not said the word, the C word, and the C word is capitalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, Ms. Teresa already talked about greed and corporate greed. But, you know, again, I'm here thinking as we think about, you know, PFAS and where it has lived in all the, 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 the items that you find it in. I mean, all this is, you know, what happened with the, the lead and, the, you know, again, again the air quality uh, pieces. These are toxins that are produced actively by, by, by folks and by corporations that are making money. And so I'm very interested to know where the industry sits uh, or industry sits within these conversations, what roles they play and how we are bringing them in, calling them in or not um, in terms of solutioning and, you know, again, processing and solutioning. And I, I just want to lift that piece up that as we rush towards um, profiteering and um, and, the, and, pro and progress and quote development, understanding that these are the side effects of rushing towards that, right? Is that what is the cost? Are we willing to sort of put our future, our present and future um, on, on the on the on the on the hanger, right? In, 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 in order to chase after quote unquote development and, mm -hmm. and quote unquote progress. And so these are just reflective questions I want to introduce for, for our audience as we and, and, and our, our group here as we sort of you know reflect. But going back to the question, Anna, in terms of um uh PFAS and, and, the, and the health pieces, and uh, my colleague here has spoken excellently about those 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 uh health uh, hazards, the CDC list these uh, chemicals as causing increases in cholesterol levels. Mm -hmm. So we can see that there's a tie into cardiovascular health or, or heart health or heart disease, which, you know, then has poor outcomes. They have also been known to lower antibody response to vaccines. So it renders us 
immunocompromised, whereby we uh, don't respond to vaccines uh, as robustly as we could, and therefore as vulnerable to infectious illness. They have produced changes in liver enzymes. They ha have been linked to uh, uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension and preeclampsia, which are basically uh, diseases of hypertension in pregnancy that is the number one driver of maternal mortality um, in the United States. And we know that United States leads the high income countries when it comes to maternal mortality. And you can see now the intersections with, you know, environmental exposures. They've been linked to small decreases in birth weight and of course, kidney and testicular cancer. And it's hundred percent, as my colleague said, um, drawn along the lines of, you know, who gets to be protected from mm. these um, exposures and who doesn't, whose lives <laughs> matter, shall I say, mm -hmm. right? Um, in terms of what policies and investments, and I come back again to that word, investments are made to ensure that people's and communities' health um, is protected from the impact of these um, these environmental hazards. And, and, and that is a matter of us as a society, what decisions we're making, what conversations we're having, and who we're holding responsible and accountable accountable to ensure that all members, all members of our communities and our society are protected from these, um, from these negative impacts. Yes, it is absolutely drawn along the lines of socioeconomic, um, uh, uh, you know, access and, 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 uh, and, and strength, as well as, of course, because again, America, there's intersectionality, you know, with race. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, Monica uh, in the comments is saying the commodification of bottled water is a driver for PFAS, uh, wanting to make note of that. Also saying excellent town hall, Dr. Opara, Dr. Shriver, great balance. Uh, Barbara is uh, also given some love. This has been an excellent town hall. Thank you. And Sue Kelly is tuning in from uh, Tonawanda, New York. Might have already said that one. We have a lot of comments coming in. All right. So I want to make sure, as was already mentioned, if you Google EPA Superfund site, you can find where Superfund sites are in your community. But I do want to make sure that we drop a link to a pretty cool site that I found. It's called Toxic Sites. It's a website and searchable database that catalogs all Superfund mm -hmm. sites in the country in real time using data provided by the US EPA. We'll be sure to drop a link to that into the chat. That is www.toxicsites.us. All right. So now as we close things out, I want to bring back Mike Basile and Professor Connolly into the mix. Uh, and Professor Connolly, uh, I am curious as we kind of wrap things up now, uh, what is one thing that you would like to leave our audience knowing or thinking about as we wrap up this conversation? First of all, thank you for including me with these amazing people who I've learned a lot and, and given, given a lot to think about. I want to leave with the thought that, that Margaret Mead said, never doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. We saw this one major lesson from Love Canal. This group of marginalized women stood up for themselves and became a major part of creating new legislation that's changed environmental laws, not perfectly, but for the better, with the help of passionate advocates like tireless attorney Richard Lippis, who's a friend and a historic UB adjunct, who's te here, who teaches future lawyers here. But there's so much more to be done. And these future lawyers and future advocates and future doctors need to be there to help people in the community. So, so leave here knowing that changes like those that Teresa and others are calling for can be made too slowly, but with progress, if we retain tenacity and hope. I really appreciate that, uh, Professor Connolly. Thank you so much. So, Teresa, uh, now I'd love to hear from you again. I wonder, uh, as you so beautifully laid out, you know, some of the struggles that you are up against, some of the work that you have been doing, some of the injustice that you are trying to bring attention to, what is next for you and the work that you are doing there in Southwest Detroit in 48217? Well, what's next for us at Southwest Detroit and Greater Detroit and Michigan? We are building coalitions across cultural lines and racial lines to build capacity to address things at from the policy level with our legislatures. Matter of fact, May the second, uh, we are going to have what we call a toxic tour to, for uh, for uh, legislatures and media, so we can bring them and show them up personal and uh, uh, personal how we coexist with industry. We have to educate our legislatures. They're making laws for us and they don't even understand our lives and what we live on a day 
daily basis. They don't even consult with us as the resident ex that have discovered the challenges of the community for them to make laws. We, every time we get a turnover of our legislators, we have to go and educate them our, from our city council to our state legislatures, to our congressional leaders. We have, so we're building a coalition to address things at the policy level. We're advocating right now for a true water affordability to work from a policy level. Got it. Thank you so much for that, Teresa. Um, and Kara is saying, I'm thankful for programs like this that bring awareness to these issues. Heidi is saying, I too am a cancer survivor now and understand your concerns. Um, so, okay, now, uh, Mike Basile, in your decades of service and experience, I'm wondering as we close out here, what is something that you wish more people knew about Love Canal and the work that the EPA has done in that area? I think a lot of people have to understand, first of all, that Love Canal occurred in 77, 78. Of course, the dumping of the waste from Hooker Chemical occurred many years prior. But remember, EPA was a very young agency. We were created in December of 1970. And this was one of the, you got to remember the, 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 the regulations that EPA was adopting as a, as a young federal agency that was only seven or eight years old. Uh, we were young, and we, as a result, we created the CERCLA Superfund legislation. Love Canal truly was the impetus for citizen environmental activism. And I think uh, the, 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 the women that we saw on the clip really typified that, and they actually were the beginning of the environmental movement in this country. We've learned a lot from that. We've come a long way. And we at EPA learned a great deal about community involvement and how we had to listen to not only the women, the families, but the people that live across the street or on top of a problem. And as a result, industry really turned the corner as well. Industry has the checks and balances in place for the most part in communities. And today, most industrial facilities that you live across the street from or you drive by, they have community action groups that are represent cross-section of people from their community, from educators to religious, relig religious leaders, and people who live down the street from, the, from these facilities. And they meet regularly, and they inform the public, and they are like an outreach. And they, are, they can help tell the story about what goes on behind the gate at like a Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company or an EI DuPont. So I think we've come a long way. Just a reminder to the public to get involved and not be afraid to call your county or your state or the Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you for hosting this. Got it. Thank you so much for your time, Mike. And uh, Professor Mike Schreiber, so Love Canal was the tip of the iceberg. Clearly, we have demonstrated that and explored that and laid that out a little bit tonight. I wonder, though, what do you think needs more attention and policy as it relates to environmental and legacy pollution? Yeah, I, I guess I'd go, go back to actually our entire regulatory system was designed uh, in the 60s and 70s, as we just heard uh, from the other, the other Mike on this call. Uh, for an era that was looking backwards and trying to clean up contamination. And as we've heard, our work is not nearly done with that. It'll probably almost never be done because we keep discovering discovering more and more. But we're in a totally new era, right? I mean, climate change is completely scrambling uh, the basics of our ecosystems. Things like invasive species are coming through. And then we're realizing that how the social injustices have led to these environmental injustices. So we actually have to kind of rethink from the bottle, bottom up our entire system of environmental laws and how and how we we go about this. So that that's kind of what's on my mind with this. We've heard some really powerful stories, and I'm looking forward to seeing the full documentary here um, of the past because that's in that story again has repeated itself hundreds, thousands of times, mm -hmm. and we actually have to reform from the bottom up to prevent that from happening hundreds and thousands of times again, so that we're not telling the same story 40 or 50 years from now. Absolutely. And Dr. Opara, finally, I'm wondering if you have any last words of wisdom, uh, things about uh, your reflections either on the conversation tonight or anything about sort of the intersection of health, climate and equity that's coming up for you as we uh, round things out tonight. 
Yeah, I just want to thank you so much for hosting a powerful conversation. I want to thank all my colleagues on this uh, roundtable tonight. And I have learned so much from each and every single one of you. And thank you again. And more importantly, the audience and the fantastic questions and comments coming in. Thank you so much. I think in brief, I, start, I second all my uh, co-panelists. Uh, reflections and thoughts, absolutely. And again, I, I, I really want to build off of Professor Connolly's offering that, you know, we have a saying back home, I am Nigerian born and baked in Detroit. I like to say born in Nigeria, baked in Detroit, honey. And we have a saying back home that anyone who thinks they are too small or too only to make a difference has never spent the night with a mosquito. Because when you spend the night with a mosquito, honey, you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, something happened last night. Okay. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't take much. And I was so inspired by the stories of the Love Canal women who were absolutely underestimated and showed themselves to be powerful. We definitely have more power than we think we have. And so it's waking up in the morning and finding where is your sphere of influence? And just start by speaking up as you learn more about the issues at hand. Talk about the ways that they are all intersectional. Ensure that you're being intentional in terms of the intersectionality and the inclusivity of your lens, of your analysis and your problem solving. Work with the people like Ms. Teresa who have the expertise that have uh, they have they have the knowledge and the experience of change making and movement building they've been doing it for years and years we have to learn to build those coalitions across all sectors of society and across all disciplines and professions as well and finally we do have to begin to advocate for a transformation of health professional training uh, whereby we are beginning to name and understand and include mandate i would say training of healthcare professionals in environmental health and environmental justice and especially learning how to work with our legal colleagues and our uh, people in environmental care and, um, and, and think even robustly and creatively, um, engineers and urban planners and farmers, agricultural folks, folks across industry to be able to build the solutions that are inclusive of, of a justice lens. So with that, I hope that that um, hopefully contributes something of value. And again, I've taken away so much from this conversation. Thanks for hosting this town hall. Oh, thank you so much. I too have taken away so much from this conversation. Um, and before we wrap things up, I just want to read a couple more comments coming in from Monica with We the People of Detroit, who says this is not our fault, but it must be our fight. We can make the change. And also says, yes, the power of the matriarch is intersectional and innovative. And with that, wow. it is... <laughs> <laughs> it is about that time to wrap up another PBS Climate Virtual Town Hall. I'd like to extend my most sincere and warmest gratitude to all of our guests, uh, all of our panelists for tonight. And a big thank you to the wonderful team at Detroit PBS. We have, of course, Dean Underwood, who has been holding it down uh, behind the scenes for us tonight. We have Adam Fox Long, Colleen O'Donnell, Mila Murray, and Lana Kintardi. And a big thank you to our friends at American Experience for allowing us to feature some clips from the Poison Ground documentary. Again, be sure to check your local list or head to PBS American Experience for more info. I also want to give a shout out to all of the town hall co-hosts and cross-streaming partners that have been amplifying this event out to their audiences. We have American Experience in Boston. We've got Michigan Learning Channel in Detroit, Michigan, PBS Books in Detroit, Michigan, Circle of Blue in Traverse City, Michigan, uh, Planet Detroit in Detroit, uh, WNMU in Marquette, Michigan. We have WPBS in Watertown, New York, WBGU in Bowling Green, Ohio, PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio, Detroit PBS, WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania, WNIT Michigan, and South Bend, Indiana, We the People of Detroit in Detroit, Michigan, and the U of M C School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I am Anna Seisling for Great Lakes Now. Thank you so much for joining me for another great virtual town hall. Please take two minutes to fill out a short survey for us about the town hall tonight. We'll be sure to drop that link into the chat. Thank you again, and we will see you next time. <laughs>